The second section will be on appropriateness of the transfusion practices. Uh, you will be known to be others in transfusion medicine. You will be led by me, myself, Dr. Ashwin K. Mohan, uh, transfusion medicine senior resident. And uh, the first uh, session will be chaired by me and the second and vice versa. The second session will be presented by me and chaired by Dr. Pradeep Anandji. And uh, Dr. Mohi Gupta from the Jawa Surgery Department is here to help us with the case which we are presenting. So uh, once again, I welcome you all to the uh, session and I welcome Dr. Pradeep to do uh, his first section on incident reporting in Department of Transition. A very good morning to all present here. The topic for today's CGI presentation is Incident Reporting in the Department of Transfusion Medicine Names Rishikesh. So first of all, uh, what is the quality policy of our blood bank here at AIMS Rishikesh? So at our department, our aim is to provide an adequate sustainable supply of blood components wherein we provide the right blood component to the right patient in the right quantity at the right time while conforming to all the quality requirements for the same. So since the inception of our blood bank in 2015 till the end of 2022, so we have issued almost 1,70,000 units so far, the mainstay being packed red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, random donor, platelets, cryoprecipitate and as newer requirements for newer blood components uh, came into action, we, we developed newer components as well like single donor platelets, COVID convalescent plasma during the pandemic, peripheral blood stem cells. So this is a graphical representation of our year-wise blood components issued wherein we can see there is a steady rise in the transfusion requirements year-wise. Year except the 2020 year in which we are hit by the pandemic. So with the ever increasing load and ever increasing <coughs> issues of blood components, there is every chance that we might make a mistake. So it might be multi multifactorial and I would like to discuss our experience on these kind of mistakes. First of all, what is an incident? Before that, what is an error and an accident? So an error is an unplanned deviation from the hospital policies or the standing standard operating procedures which may be due to human factors or a system problem, whereas accident is an unplanned occurrence which is not due to any deviation from policies or SOPs, it's an accident in true sense. So due to such an error or an accident, which may lead to an adverse outcome is known as an incident. It might affect, in this case, the safety and quality of our blood components or the safety of the blood donor or the recipient. Now what is the fate of such an incident? It can have a number of fates. First of all, it can lead to a near miss event wherein an incident is discovered before the start of a process which could have led to an adverse outcome. For example, if a wrong blood is issued to a patient and we discover that before the start of the transfusion and prevent it, then it is a near miss event. Whereas uh, a no harm event is an incident which is discovered after the start of the process but did not have an adverse outcome. Suppose if the wrong blood is started to be transfused to that patient but no adverse event occurs, then it is a no harm event. And finally, an incident may lead to an adverse reaction which is an undesirable outcome. For example, a transfusion reaction in a patient, but it may, may or may not be due to an incident. So once such an incident occurs, how do we manage it? First of all is the prompt detection of the incident followed by the remedial action. Now remedial action is the immediate steps that we take to alleviate the symptoms of that current undesirable situation. For example, uh, during a transfusion reaction, Stopping of the transfusion and informing the blood bank is the remedial action during that situation. It will be followed by incident reporting and investigation which go in hand in hand. While investigating an uh, incident, we, we use the Ishikawa diagram or the fishbone diagram for root cause analysis of the problem, wherein the problems are classified under the famous 5 M's, material, method, machine, mother, nature and man. For example, if a faulty component is prepared, the problem might be due to the material, for example, the blood bags used or might be due to the method of phlebotomy or the method of component separation. It might, do, might be due to machine factors like a faulty centrifuge or a faulty blood collection monitor. Might be due to environmental factors like uh, subjecting the component to extremes of temperature or might be due to human errors like improper skills. So after we find out the root cause, we take the necessary actions to prevent the occurrence and recurrence of the problem, which may be a corrective action or a preventive action. Now a corrective action is the action which will address the root cause of that incident and we will elimin try to eliminate it so that it doesn't recur in the future. Whereas a preventive action is a proactive action, it's a proactive approach wherein we eliminate the potential of such an incident to happen again in the future and wherein we prevent the occurrence again. 
So there are a number of quality tools for problem solving as we have seen in the last slide. So we can have a checklist of various things that we need during a process, frequent brainstorming ses sessions or the fishbone diagram that we've seen in the last slide, all of which will lead to a solution. So now I would like to share our experience with the incidents that we have over the years. So from 2018 onwards, we started a system of rigorous incident reporting and taking the following corrective and preventive actions as necessary, which saw 21 incidents being detected in 2018. And due to this policy of rigorous imp uh, implementation of incident reporting, we can see there is a rise in the number of incidents in 27, uh, in, to 27 in 2019. This was because we, we tried to detect even the smallest errors and so the number seems large. But in the later years, as we took the corrective and preventive actions for those incidents, we see there is a decrease in the number of incidents. But in the year 2020 or 2021, the number of incidents being 9 might be due to the pandemic as well. But in 2022 as well, we have 13 incidents only, which is much lesser than the previous years, which points towards the correct uh, preventive and corrective actions in play. Uh, Ma'am, uh, these are the incidents which are not only related to transfusion but also the laboratory practices that we are uh, doing in our lab. Like, number of transfusions per year, is that the denominator? Uh, that plus number of transfusions which is coming in the next week. This is the actual number. Number, but what's the denominator? Maybe. No, the number of transfusions done and the incidents reported. Ma'am, uh, these are just uh, the numbers wherein uh, each. How many transfusions? Chalo, we, we wanted to see. You can show it in the chart. Let's call it. Come on. Um, a total of uh, uh, 1,70,000 transfusions were given from 2015 onwards, ma'am. And uh, every process, be it transfusion or the laboratory practices that we are doing, wherever there is a deviation from policies or an adverse event, we are counting that as an incident. And, uh, out of the 79 incidents that we have detected since 2018, uh, almost 20%, that is 16 incidents were uh, interdepartmental, wherein other departments were also involved, and 80% of them, that is 63, were intradepartmental. It seems like a huge number, but we tried to detect even the smallest of the errors, like breakage of a test tube in a centrifuge or even a blood spill. But today, I will be discussing about all the incidents in which other departments were also involved. This is not to inculcate a blame culture, wherein we are pointing towards the mistake of others, but to inculcate a quality culture, wherein with the help of the other departments, we find out the actual problem and then deal with it. So wherein the quality of our products and the services that we are providing are maintained. First of all, we'll deal with the uh, incidents wherein uh, we received an improper sample or a request form. The most common of them was a wrong blood in tube. Here the corrective action was to get a properly filled form and a new sample with, with the uh, new, new sample with every request form that we received. And as a preventive action, we stressed on the importance of correct patient identification, whether be it bedside or whether be it in the blood bank. Next up is uh, an incident wherein the policy of proper filling of forms and uh, sending of samples was not followed, where we received an FFP request. Which, uh, which was without the name of the patient or the gender of the patient and also the blood sample was also not sent. So as a corrective action, we requested the sample to be sent with the properly filled blood request form and as a preventive action, we stressed on the importance of such a thing, proper labeling of samples and proper filling of forms with all the information so that we can be clear about the indication of transfusion and also correctly identify the patient who will need the transfusion. Next up is a case uh, wherein an incorrect uh, previous blood group history was uh, reported in the request form. As a corrective action, uh, we rechecked the previous history and also we, yeah, we got the resampling of the patient done so that there is no mix up. And as a preventive action, we stressed on the importance of rechecking the previous history of every patient, be it in the bedside or from the side of a blood bank. So the serious hazards of transfusion study, the short study UK, they have been classifying all these errors and incidents and, the, and trying to elicitate all the reasons associated with it. So in the 2014 reports, uh, the most common reason for a wrong blood in tube was the patient being not identified correctly or the sample not being labeled at the bedside. 
So we have been uh, facing similar problems in our setup as well. The so next uh, is an incident uh, regarding blood issue, wherein there was a delay of issue of the blood component due to an improper handover. As a corrective action, we got the blood unit immediately issued and as a preventive action, we started a system of proper handwritten documented handover rather than a verbal one, wherein it's very easy to forget things. Next are the incidents uh, related to blood administration. The first two of them were regarding the presence of a clot in the bag, wherein the corrective action taken was to discard that unit and get a new unit issued for the patient. And preventive action was uh, adequate staff training for better phlebotomy practices, better component handling uh, practices, so that such an incident doesn't happen again. The next was a blood flow issue, wherein the IV access of the patient was not patent. Uh, we inspected the unit for uh, visually for clots, but we didn't find any. And then we got communicated that the IV access had a problem. And as a preventive action, we stressed on the importance of maintaining an, a patent IV access before every transfusion. And the next is an, import, uh, an improper storage of blood in the ward, in the refrigerators that are there in the ward, which led to incorrect patient identification due to mixing of the units in that refrigerator. As a corrective action, the correct intended unit was finally issued to the patient and transfused. And as a preventive action, we scheduled ward visits and appropriate training of the nursing officers and all the stakeholders involved in a transfusion for better transfusion practices. Next was an incident regarding an uninformed adverse transfusion reaction, wherein a febrile reaction was there in the recipient and the unit was discontinued, but then again, it was resumed after 12 hours, which resulted in another febrile episode. As a corrective action, we did the uh, immunohematological workup of the adverse transfusion reaction and we found no abnormalities. And as a preventive action, we scheduled training sessions for better transfusion practices. Next was a blood administration mistake. Uh, wherein the transfusion was started 6 hours after the issue of blood which should have been started within 30 minutes and completed within 4 hours of issue. This led to a febrile reaction in the patient. Then again as a corrective action we did the advanced, adverse transfusion reaction workup and found no immunohematological incompatibilities. And as a preventive action again we advised training sessions for better transfusion practices. The next two incidents are regarding incorrect patient identification. Wherein the root cause was in the first one the blood units of two patients in the, with the same name in the same ward were mixed up. So as a corrective action, the transfusion was immediately stopped. We received the bag. We confirmed the cross match of the two units with both the patients. But then again, we discarded the unit because the transfusion time had elapsed. And in the second case, two patients of the same name uh, were there at the same time where the request form was being processed. And due to the, which the incompatibility issues of one patient, it was wrongly conveyed to the other patient, which was in the OT and immediate need of transfusion. As a corrective action, we issued immediately the blood unit required to the patient in the OT. And as a preventive action, we started uh, patient identification by using not only the patient name and UHID, but also other identifiers as well, such as the place of residence or phone number, which is, which is uh, generally unique to an individual. And the last incident was regarding seroconversion uh, of a blood donor, wherein in the previous blood donation, the donor was uh, TTA negative for all the transfusion transmitted inf uh, infections and in the next donations, in the next donation 1.5 months back when he came to donate an, a single donor platelet, he came out to be HCV reactive. As a corrective action, we informed all the consultants about the recipients of the previous blood, blood components that had been issued and we followed up those recipients and no one came to be HCV reactive following the transfusions and also the donor was referred to gastroenterology. As a preventive action, we put forward an option of universal NAT testing or nucleic acid testing so that we reduce the window period as much as possible. Also, we stressed on the importance of eliciting proper donor history, which would in turn uh, inculcate uh, hepatitis awareness in the community. So the short reports of 2014, uh, they tried to find out wrong, uh, what are the mistakes that led to a wrong transfusion. So an improper request was, uh, the number of improper requests was 108 and sample related sample taking problems were 686 which were, which were mitigated then and there itself and all the laboratory errors relating to the incidents which were almost 250 in number and also blood component restriction and blood component administration related problems were also of a huge number 140 and 162 respectively. Now, so the short study in UK in 2014, they also classified the adverse incidents which were made due to mistakes. 
So we can see a multitude of problems wherein incorrect blood component transfusion anti D related errors and handling and storage errors of components were the highest. So after such, uh, after such data available to us and all the experience that we had over the years, and we couldn't agree with Eleanor Roosevelt more that we should learn from the mistakes of others because we can't live long enough to make the mistakes all ourselves. And if we have this uh, policy in mind, we can move towards the goal of total quality, wherein uh, not only addressing the problem and finding out the root cause and addressing it then and there is a solution, but also uh, continuous improvement towards all the preventive actions that we are taking, whether it can be improved or not, have to be kept in mind. Now, in order to uh, now summarizing uh, all the corrective actions and preventive actions that we discussed earlier. So, for a wrong blood in tube, the preventive action would be a correct patient identification using as many identifiers as possible. And for improperly filled forms or without a sample, the preventive action would be proper filling of the forms with each and every uh, information and proper labeling of the samples. And for incorrect patient history, that is, that is sometimes mentioned in the forms. As a preventive action, we should always check the previous history of the patient, be it bedside or be it in the blood bank. Or in cases related to delay in issue of blood components due to impo uh, improper handover, as a preventive action, uh, there should be a written document handover at any instance of duty change because verbal things are very easy to miss and forget. And in case of a TTI reactive repeat donor, we can put forward an option of universal nucleic acid testing we should elicit adequate donor history and provide awareness to the community regarding hepatitis and other transmission transmitted infections. So this is a picture of our sample or blood request rejection form wherein any improperly filled request or any improperly labeled sample is returned back to the ward with the appropriate reasons. And this is a picture of our handover register wherein all our residents and technicians they write down the handovers that are to be given to the next duty person and not relying just upon verbal communication. And next up, where is, uh, where the, wherever there is a clot in the bag, as a preventive measure, uh, we inculcated staff training periodically like quarterly or monthly trainings regarding good phlebotomy practices, good component handling practices which would prevent such an error. In cases where there was a complaint of blood flow, as a preventive action, we started a culture of visual check. The visual check at, at the moment of preparing the component, storage of the component, testing of the component and also issue of the component at these four points and also proper maintaining of the IV access patency before the start of a transfusion. And in cases where improper blood storage in the ward refrigerators led to the mix up of units as a preventive action, scheduled ward visits and regular trainings of the stakeholders of transfusion, be it the nursing officers, be it the JRs or the interns regarding good transfusion practices. And in cases uh, where there was an uninformed adverse transfusion reaction and in cases where transfusion was started six hours after, a, after the issue of a blood unit which led to an adverse transfusion reaction in that case. As a preventive action we suggested training sessions like monthly or quarterly or six monthly. And in incidents where blood units of patients are being mixed up in the same ward due to same name or same credentials, we stressed on the importance of correct identification of the patient using as many identifiers as possible. So this is the picture of the training sessions that we that we had in the past. Now some take home messages that I want to give at the end. So each step in this blood delivery pathway is very critical and we should identify the areas of highest risk of mix up for example bedside patient identification. Now so how, however urgent the transfusion might be we should follow each and every step because it is critical and this will prevent a patient from a fatal transfusion reaction because lives here are at stake. And finally even after all the precautions that we take, even after an incident has happened we have to deal with it properly, report it, report it as quickly as possible, perform a root cause analysis, find out the actual cause and address it by corrective and preventive actions and not only stop there but also to monitor the system. This will, this will ensure continuous quality improvement and better transfusion practices. Thank you. I would like to invite Dr. Ashwin here. He will continue with the presentation and will discuss a case regarding appropriateness of transfusion. And I would like to invite Dr. Mohit as well. He would be chairing this session with me. Thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, 
as my colleague Dr. Pradeep discussed, he was discussing about the adverse events and uh, adverse transfusion reactions which can occur uh, in transfusion practices. So in many studies which, uh, which was conducted throughout the world, it was found that all these manual errors and all which he was discussing, um, the chances of such errors are more during night time. So my uh, topic for CGR is appropriateness of transfusion practices during non-routine hours. So basically it is from 5 pm to 8 am in our department. So coming to the background uh, of this discussion, uh, all these points will be discussed in the uh, coming slides. The transition decision should be evidence based. Sometimes blood common demands are received that may not considered appropriate. Non-routine hour transfusion should be restricted to emergency cases and uh, non-emergency transfusion increases the workload of the blood center and regular auditing of the non-routine hour transfusion may be helpful to improve the uh, hospital transfusion practices. So I will be presenting a case. So this case is a case of 74 year old male patient with SDH who came to the came to our emergency and had to undergo uh, emergency craniectomy uh, and the patient was on anticoagulant therapy so multiple blood units like FFP, PRBC and cryo had to be transfused to the patient and we were able to provide all those uh, blood products and with, uh, with that blood product uh, the neurosurgery team was able to do proper surgery and which helped in better prognosis and better quality of life for the patient. So coming to the case, a 74 year old male patient presented to emergency on 28-11-2022, 12.30 am with complaints of multiple episodes of vomiting associated with sweating and uneasiness followed by irrelevant talking, abnormal behavior and finally unconscious. The patient was intubated in emergency department in view of poor neurological status and risk of threatened airway. Then coming to the past history of the patient, the patient had a history of visit to AIMS emergency department 26-11-2022, few days back only following an episode of chest pain, unconsciousness and fall at home for which he was admitted to cardiology SDU in view of episodes of intermittent atrial fibrillation. The NCCT head was done do during the previous admission on 26-11-2022 in view of loss, of loss of consciousness which revealed only scalp hematoma with no intraparenchymal bleed or skull fracture. The patient underwent, underwent coronary angiography which revealed double vessel disease and continued on optimal medical therapy and anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation which included as aspirin and epixamen and, and statins. The patient is a known hypertensive diagnosed with lymphoma in 2011 treated with archop regimen currently in uh, remission. On examination, general examination the pulse rate was 102 beats per minute, BP was 1690 mmHg, respiratory rate 24 per minute, temperature a febrile, uh, respiratory system bilateral, chest clear. CVS, S1, S2 held normally, no murmur were present, per abdomen soft, no palpable organomegaly, bubble sounds were present, CNS, E1, B1, M5 and on intubation um, on emergency it, it became E1, BT, M5 and pupils were bilateral 3 mm reacting to light, uh, power moving all four limbs against gravity. On investigation, uh, the HB was 13.2. TLC uh, 11,600 cells per millimeter cube, plainly 2.82 lakh per millimeter cube, and PTNR was 10.9 and 1, and all other uh, LFT and KFT parameters were within normal limits. Then coming to investigation, the urgent uh, CT scan was done, NCCT was done, and uh, it suggested fresh left frontotemporoparietal acute SDH uh, with a mass effect and midline shift. Uh, urgent uh, left frontotemporoparietal decompressive craniotomy was planned. So this is the CT scan of the patient. So here uh, you will be able to see the collection, hypertense collection and it is causing a midline shift. So that was the SDS. And uh, so why the transition was required to the patient? Because the patient was on aspirin. Uh, which cause functional dysregulation of the platelet aggregation and on apixabin which is a factor 10 inhibitor and do not have an old do, these two medications that is aspirin and apixabin do not have any specific drug causing a reversal of its action except only remedies to wait for 48 to 72 hours for the surgery which was not possible in our case due to rapid deterioration of the neurological status of the patient. So out of the different prerequisites needed for the OT, blood products were one of the important ones and since the patient was on anticoagulant therapy, adequate transfusion of platelet, FFP, PRVCs and cryo was planned during the night hours itself. So the, uh, these are the list of the blood products which were arranged for the patient, 7 FFPs, 2 adult platelet doses, 6 cryo precipitates and 3 PRVCs. Then uh, this is the prognostic marker for outcome of an acute uh, SDH. So here we can see out of the 7 markers, almost 5 is against the patient. So patient age was more than 60, GCS was less than 8, the patient was on antiplatelet medication, 
and thickness of the hematoma and mid lane shift was there. The thickness was 11 mm and the mid lane shift was also there. And the comor coming to comorbidities, the patient had hypertension. So all these five parameters were against a good prognosis for the patient. And the duration of the ictus was less than six hours and anisocoria was absent. So only these two parameters were in support of a good prognosis for the patient. So uh, the operation happened, uh, the craniotomy happened and all those blood products were transfused and in post-operative day 1 the patient improved to GCS of E3 VT M6 with minimal positivity in uh, right upper and lower limb. In post-operative day 2 the patient was extubated and improved to GCS E4 V4 M6 with slurring of speech. Uh, cardiology opinion was taken and tap amlodipine and tap atorvastatin and metoprolol was were started and gradually improved to conscious oriented following commands ambulatory with minimal support occasionally with normal speech with gradual improvement in positivity uh, of uh, right upper and lower limb and got discharge in a satisfactory condition with follow-up advice uh, in 6 12 22 that is day 8 of, 8 of admission so this is the repeat ct after the surgery so uh, here we can, uh, you can see uh, uh, post surgery the uh, def de defect on the craniotomy and also the SDH and the midline shift has, has also disappeared. So uh, even, even if the patient was having a bad prognosis with timely transition and timely um, acting by neurology su neurosurgery team the patient had a better quality of life and good prognosis. So the question here is, is this an appropriate transition in the night hours? And as you all know the answer is yes. Uh, why? The rational behind and was on anti -gurgulant. hence the transition of the blood products at the earliest was of utmost important to start the surgery which resulted in a better prognosis. So uh, when I came through this case, I went through, so I, I decided to assess the effectiveness of the transition during non-routine hours. So I went, uh, I investigated into few modalities of transition. So first one was CT ratio. So I checked the CT ratio of PRBC units issued during non-routine hours for one year time period. So CT ratio means the number of units cross match by number of units transfused. So it will be uh, finding if, uh, it, uh, you see this modality, we will be finding out if unnecessary cross matches is being happening. Like we are arranging the blood for the patient and it is not getting transfused. So the total number of pro units cr cross match in one, one year time period was 11,030 and total number of units issued during non-routine hours were 8,457. So the CT ratio was coming around 1.30. So this uh, num uh, number of CT ratio was al almost good because almost all the blood products which are arranged for the patient uh, is getting transfused also. So this is reasonably good CT ratio. So I further investigated into the appropriateness of the request form which I, which I am using. Like I went through all the request forms, uh, what is the diagnosis and how, how many blood units have been arranged. So when I investigated into it, it is a data of non-routine hour transfusions in AIMS blood center for one year time period. So total unit arranged in a year during day and night, like during routine and non-routine hours were 44,053 out of which almost 51.68 percentage of uh, the work workload was coming on non-routine hours that is from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock. So you can see that a huge workload is coming during non-routine hours on our staff and out of this uh, 22,770 uh, the units arranged in non-routine hours 73 percentage were for appropriate indications and 27 percentage were for inappropriate indication. You can see in the graph almost 73 percentage for appropriate indication during non-routine hours and 27 percentage were uh, inappropriate uh, indications for non-routine hours. So the problem is this 27 percentage will delay uh, the transition happening for this 73 percentage. So uh, in, uh, during this uh, non-routine hours almost each and every request will be an emergency uh, like the case which I discussed and that patient, those patients will, should get transfusion at the earliest. So when such inappropriate indication, indicated requests are coming it will delay uh, the uh, transfusion for the 73 percentage of uh, patients and it may um, affect the prognosis and quality of the life of those patients. So uh, uh, when I analyze the number of requests, in an, on an average we will be uh, receiving almost 25 requests per night like uh, during non-routine average and out of it 7 were inappropriate and uh, that means every 4th request during non-routine average is inappropriate. So that uh, it directly means every 5th request reaching the blood bank get delayed due to inappropriate request which preceded it. So what are the problems associated with inappropriate transfusion and non-routine hours? One is the delay in processing of appropriate transfusion like the 73 percentage and 27 percentage. Uh, 73 percentage uh, transfusion will get de delayed because of the 27 percentage of um, inappropriate request and keeping extra manpower at night will suffer work of routine hours. The chances of error are high in night, night hour 
work and extra work like workup transfusion reaction can come out and issues related to blood donations are also uh, a bit problematic during the night hours which will affect indirectly affect the stoke in the blood center so this this is a study conducted in new zealand hospital so what they did was all the red cell units transfused between uh, during the non routine hours that is from 8 pm to 8 am were analyzed and they came up with, with these findings that is adherence to recommended best transfusion practices were poor at night because during the night time uh, 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 the healthcare workers were uh, like not bit hesitant and all to give proper uh, observation to the patient during transfusion so the adherence to the recommended best transfusion practices were poor 12% of the transfusions exceeded four hour recommendation as you all know a prbc transfusion should Uh, should end within four hours after onset of the transfusion. So, in twelve percent of the transfusions, it exceeded four hour recommendation, and this may lead to unnecessary transfusion reaction happening. The end of the transfusion observation fell to less than eighty percentage, and lowest com complaints rate, almost sixty nine percentage, occurred during early morning hours, that is six a.m. and all. In addition, they came to uh, know that almost four transfusion reactions were reported. and when they questioned more detailedly almost double this number that is four transfusion reactions were uh, 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 reported but almost nine unreported reactions were there so the problem with this un un unreported transfusion reaction is that if a patient is having a transfusion reaction for the next for the transfusion uh, the blood bank services will be doing some product modification or um, uh, things will be done for example if it is an fnsdr we will be doing product modification like leuco filtration or if it is an adverse trans hemolytic transfusion reaction we will be careful when selecting the next blood unit so uh, when it is uh, such report, uh, such reactions are going unreported so it will affect our services and it will lead to more transfusion reaction to the patient and um, in many of the transfusion reaction what happens is during a second episode of transfusion reaction it can be more lethal to the patient so i was analyzing the transfusion reaction data over one year time period in aims research so total number of transfusion reaction in one one year time period were 86 out of which 53 happened during non routine hours and 33 happened during routine hours then uh, this is a uh, data from show that is serious hazard of transfusion so this is a registry where the all the adverse events happening with transfusion in uk will be registered whenever there is any adverse event happening when is, whenever there is any transfusion reaction happening they have to report to this uh, registry so they they documented that serious hazard of transfusion report of 2005 has stated that 37% of the transfusion error occurred during out of four hours and according to that uh, the joint uh, united kingdom blood transfusion and tissue Pl Pl transplantation service professional advisory committee in in its uh, um, transfusion handbook uh, in point number 4 safe transfusion right blood right patient right time and right place Uh, documents that non essential out of our request for transfusion and overnight administration of blood should be avoided wherever possible because of an increased risk of errors so in order to conclude the cgr in the present case the patient needed urgent transfusion and proper communication happened between the departments and because of the transfusion timely surgery happened and patient's life was saved uh, and the patient had a better prognosis and quality of life so we would like to do same to each and every patient for that appropriate appropriate of transfusion reaction practice transfusion practices during non routine hours is of utmost importance thank you